Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin, went to great lengths to conceal their identity. They used anonymous email services and Tor to register the domain bitcoin.org, then released the Bitcoin white paper, wrote the Bitcoin code, and then fostered an early Bitcoin community, all while being very mindful about how much information they revealed about themselves. After more than 10 years, we still do not know who invented Bitcoin or why they disappeared. It's not an easy thing to remain hidden these days, so the fact that they did is an accomplishment. And to me, it just makes Bitcoin that much more interesting. It shows that before any work on Bitcoin took place, this person was already an expert in privacy. What can look like extreme paranoia, someone with something to hide, covering their tracks, is actually just a way of doing things for certain privacy-focused individuals. For a small portion of society, it's absolutely worth taking time and effort to keep your information out of the public domain. It's getting harder and harder every year to do this. You don't need me to tell you how many cameras are out there in public. It's just becoming easier and easier to track and store data. You know, there's cameras everywhere. And obviously, this thing. I know Apple right now is doing a push for privacy right now, but does anyone really believe that? It doesn't feel good to have to trust some company or to put effort into electing politicians that you, you hope, you believe, will do the right thing. Reform and reinvention. So there are really two paths you can choose to go down. You, you can support politicians who you think will protect human rights, or you can do it yourself. In late 1992, Eric Hughes, Tim May, and John Gilmore founded a small group with those thoughts in mind that would meet monthly in the San Francisco Bay Area. In attendance was an activist and hacker going by the name St. Jude, who, as a joke, proposed they call themselves cypherpunks, combining the words cypher with cyberpunks. And that's what they became. This group grew to hundreds and hundreds of people who communicated from all over the world online discussing mathematics, cryptography, computer science, politics, and philosophy. And in 1999, a young man moved from Virginia to this San Francisco Bay Area and quickly became part of this community of cypherpunks. Today, we're gonna to talk about that man, Leonard Sassaman, better known as Len, and the theory that he is Satoshi Nakamoto. For whatever reason, here in the United States, California has always seemed to attract a certain type of person. Someone searching for something new. Think about the gold rush of the 1800s, the rise of Hollywood, Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley. Many major street gangs were founded in California. The Bloods, the Crips, the Aryan Brotherhood, Hell's Angels, TRG, MS-13, they all started in California. 
I'm not comparing cypherpunks to MS-13, but my point is that desperation often leads to innovation. And after Len moved west, he really worked like a man who was desperate and through his coding and political activism, rubbed shoulders with a lot of names Bitcoin people would be familiar with. He collaborated with Adam Back on anonymous remailers. He worked on PGP with Hal Finney. And with Phil Zimmerman, he developed a key signing protocol named the Zimmerman Sassaman Key Signing Protocol. Name makes sense. All of these technologies, precursors to Bitcoin. And while a lot of the names I just mentioned were bright guys, Len really did stand out. At just 18, he was on the Internet Engineering Task Force, setting standards and code for the internet itself. Making these accomplishments even more impressive was that behind the scenes, Len was struggling with depression. His wife has made comments alluding that Len had a very difficult childhood with providers trying to treat this depression. In a perfect world, someone would get diagnosed and meet with a provider who clicks with them. Maybe they get prescribed a medication at the right dosage that alleviates the problem. But in the real world, unfortunately, that rarely happens. People's bodies react differently to different medication. You can build a connection with a prescriber and they move or they retire. You have some issue where you miss an appointment, the office is closed on a holiday. Maybe some trauma that led to depression in the first place is ongoing. Just so many things could go wrong. And I know there's a lot of discourse out there about privilege and how can you be depressed in a first world country? Well, life can be nasty for everyone. And the brain, just like any other part of your body, can have health issues. I'm getting a little off topic here. Just wanted to make my point that Len, despite all of this, showed an incredible work ethic that led him from a small town in Virginia to doing major presentations at hacker conferences around the world. But I know you didn't click on this for a history lesson. You, you want the meat, right? What's the real evidence that Len could be the man who was posting a Satoshi Nakamoto? It has always been suspected that Satoshi was an academic or in school, partly because of the times of the year that they posted, but also because the Bitcoin white paper was written using LaTeX, a software favored by academics. Other cypherpunk proposals for digital money like Nick Zabo's BitGold and Wei Dai's B Money were basically just emails, long paragraphs of text. The Bitcoin white paper was written like a college paper with an abstract, a conclusion, and MLA citations. At this time, Len was in school, and he was at a very interesting school called COSIC, the Computer Security and Industrial Cryptography Research Group. Working on his PhD, Len was supervised by a man named David Chom. Regardless if you're going to buy this idea that Len could be Satoshi, no one could debate that David Chom didn't pave the ground for Bitcoin to be created. This guy David was thinking about confidential transactions all the way back in the 1980s and 90s and had this company called Digicash, putting together great minds with the goal of making digital money. Digicash failed and ultimately didn't catch on. They had issues getting banks on board and I mean, ultimately they had a centralized point of failure. 
But his life experience combined with Len's own talent must have led to some pretty interesting supervision meetings. If David had failed with digital money, well, maybe Len could help with some unfinished business. The other thing with Kosick is that it's located in Belgium. Len being an American living in Europe might explain some of Bitcoin's mysteries. Satoshi references a British newspaper in the first Bitcoin block. Their language seems to have some British spellings and sayings. And if you really want to nerd out on some details, Satoshi posted February 15th, 2010, another big jump in the difficulty yesterday from 1.82 to 2.53. Referencing 14th as yesterday would make sense if they were in Europe, but not in the US. If they were in a US time zone, yesterday would still be today. Potential rare slip up there by Satoshi. In this great piece by Evan Hatch about Satoshi, clues leave us with a paradox. They suggest Satoshi was European, yet someone with the requisite skill set and exposure to Bitcoin's primary influences would likely have been American. It's a great write-up, I definitely recommend. Details how Len seems to best fit the profile to be Satoshi. It's a lot. His background and knowledge of cryptography, peer-to-peer -peer networks, hacktivism, and how he had direct or indirect connections with so many cypherpunks before the white paper showed up on a mailing list. But that can be a difficult part of Satoshi hunting. I don't want to use the word incestuous, but these cypherpunks were all very intertwined. Like a lot of areas of research, there's collaboration, but with open source projects especially, it can be difficult to know who did what under what name. We know Len had numerous pseudonyms he would post under. Uh, his old roommate has said as much. I will say that Len posted pseudonymously on the cypherpunks list constantly, including at least one fleshed out and long lived handle. And even I didn't know what it was. One handle we know for sure is him, is at Len Sassaman, his Twitter account. And what can we find? The use of the word flat instead of apartment. The spelling of gray in using the phrase bloody to describe something difficult. What's more, when you compare the times of day Satoshi posted with the times of day Len tweeted, I mean, it fits like a glove. In July of 2011, Len hung himself. It was shocking then, and it's shocking now. He left behind a loving wife, a career, and countless people involved in his life that had no idea just how bad he was struggling. His wife Meredith spoke on this at a hacker panel that was discussing mental health and I thought about taking a clip or a quote from it but it just didn't feel right. But if you are interested in that, definitely do check it out. It's a tough listen, but very powerful. Because of his passing, we don't know what Len would think of Bitcoin today. And since his death, Satoshi has not posted on the Bitcoin talk forums again. I'm going to say something provocative right now. And my intention is not to hurt any family or friends. Even if you are close to him, you must acknowledge that there is a small chance, small, that Len did not commit suicide. If we're gonna wildly speculate that Len is Satoshi, well then what does that really mean? Len was open about being visited by federal agents in the past. And a friend posted online that they would go out driving to talk because Len assumed his house was bugged. I would never imply that the powers that be 
would kill someone, that would be illegal. Um, but you have to imagine there are people out there who would want to hurt Satoshi. Look at what they did to Julian Assange. Bitcoin is right up there in being a threat to the existing state. Satoshi was right to take every step they could to protect their identity. As I said before, this write-up by Evan Hatch on Len being Satoshi is great, and I have to give them a shout-out. But missing from this piece was some obvious information. Did Len ever comment on Bitcoin? Yes, he did. Preserved on Twitter... I haven't analyzed Bitcoin, but the impression of multiple digital cash experts I've talked to is that it's bunk. Hey idiots blaming the user whose hacked Windows box lost him 25k Bitcoin. Your currency is fail if your users need to know what crypto is. This big Bitcoin heist shows Bitcoin suffers from the worst of both worlds. No strong anonymity, yet no fraud reversal protection. Of course, there have been rumors of exploits in mining software for some time. A Bitcoin worm could clean up and then clean itself. I'm a bit puzzled reading the comments of blah 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 as to why Bitcoin users become so irrational when discussing its failings. Wow, this actually looks good. The Sex Files, a dark triple X parody. Oops, wrong tweet. It's overwhelmingly negative and not critiquing in a way that might offer a solution. It's not constructive criticisms, it's just pure dismissal. I've tried to think about if I was Satoshi and then went back to my normal life, what would be the best course of action to take when talking about Bitcoin? Is the smartest thing to not talk about it? To actively continue to work on it? To be positive? To be negative? I'm not entirely sure what the best game theory approach would be. There's certainly a case to be made that being critical of Bitcoin would throw people off the scent. And that Len dismissing Bitcoin is, is his way of making sure people don't tie any connections there. But these statements were so dismissive that I can't imagine a person working three years on something blood, sweat, and tears, trying to upend banking institutions and create free money of the people, could say something like, wow, there exists a Tor plus Bitcoin illegal drug marketplace. The other question that needs to be answered is, where is the money? Even in 2011, Satoshi's presumed Bitcoin stash was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. I couldn't see Len using that money for selfish reasons. He's not going to buy a Patek Philippe. But to not put those funds into any political group, any struggling open source project, anything that could help his wife, a woman he adored, seems impossible to me. The bond Len had with Meredith was very strong. They shared their domestic life and professional life together. Frequently collaborating, and there's a bunch of presentations still online of them speaking together at conferences. At some point in those years, Meredith would have known that Len was planning or working on Bitcoin. Do men keep secrets? Yes, but Meredith was and is an accomplished hacker herself. For her not to be tapped to work on it or to help with any kind of community building, it just wouldn't fly with how Len did things. In 2007, 8, 9, 10, Len was incredibly busy with academic papers open source projects and conferences. He went to conferences multiple times a year and spoke at many of them. I mean, he was everywhere, Las Vegas, California, Belgium, Spain. The more you look at this schedule, the more conflicts you find with Satoshi posting. Satoshi was involved in a lot of troubleshooting and a lot of communication at the beginning. I mean, 
Bitcoin was not this finished product upon release. Community members found all kinds of bugs. Many people just fixed them or at least brought them to the attention of Satoshi, but not everyone was so nice. In block 74638, a guy was supposed to add 50 Bitcoin to circulation and ended up producing 184 billion. <laughs> Imagine owning 1 billion Bitcoin. So that number brought attention, but it was Satoshi who jumped in and created a patch before most in the community even knew what was happening. In the aftermath, people were confused, thinking, were we just lucky, or is Satoshi just always watching? Did they ever take time off? Point being, when I see the productivity of Len during the Satoshi years, it makes it hard for me to see him as someone at the same time holding Bitcoin up on his back. Also, just personality-wise, Len was described as kind of a, a wild guy. He had this Monopoly get-out-of-jail-free card he would use if he got pulled over. Satoshi seemed to bristle at the idea of getting attention from law enforcement. Satoshi was careful. Len was brazen. Aside from computer hacking, Len was also really involved in biohacking which is kind of what it sounds like, figuring out how to improve your own body. We all know eating yogurt is good for your gut health, right? But biohacking just takes that to the extreme. Len's speeches talking about biohacking urged people to push boundaries with chemicals, experiment, even if it meant getting attention from authorities. Earlier I made a statement that Satoshi has been quiet for many years. His last post on Bitcoin Talk was back in 2010. And that last post was pretty innocuous. Just talking about how more work needed to be done to make Bitcoin security more robust. Satoshi logged in the next day, maybe to look over some things, and then never logged back in again. But that wasn't the end. There have been messages since Len passed away. In 2014, on Satoshi's P2P Foundation account, someone wrote, I am not Dorian Nakamoto. This was when a man named Dorian Nakamoto was getting harassed by the media for sharing Satoshi's name. Then in 2015, we got this extended message from Satoshi's VistoMail email account, written in the same reserved, clear tone as previous posts. Now, it's possible these are not legit, but a user BTC Drac looked into this email, and his technical analysis was that the message was in fact from the VistoMail server. So again, these messages haven't really been debunked, there's no real proof one way or the other. What it does do is raise the issue that Satoshi might still be with us. The blocks in the Bitcoin blockchain consist of a few different types of data. Transactions, the previous hash, but there is a little wiggle room there to add some more information. And over the years, miners have put different things in there. There's song lyrics, inside jokes, I think a Chinese couple commemorated their wedding in a block. Now, if you're a miner, it's easy enough. Once your block gets added, you can throw a little something in there. But Dan Kaminsky did something more complicated and sent Bitcoin to a bunch of custom addresses, which eventually got picked up and put into a block and created some interesting text. A tribute to Len, and it actually is the face of Ben Bernanke, who was running the Fed at the time, it says Len would have probably thought this was pretty funny. I agree. I don't think Len is Satoshi, but my hope is the story was heard and people can understand why this message in block 138725 is important. Bitcoin has really taken off, but this idea of privacy, revealing your info only when you want online, remains a small counterculture community. The open source tools that 
exist to do this were not developed for profit. They were created by people who thought they made the world a better place. They reject the idea of Big Brother, that corporations have your best interest at heart, and that freedom is only affordable to elites. But there's still more work to do and discoveries to be made. So on that note, an interesting message from Meredith Patterson. Bitcoin isn't ready for prime time yet, according to its creator. Interested people can help finish it though. Thanks for watching.